Hello, I'm Bob Trubshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about why Anglo-Saxons did not think that elves and giants and dragons were supernatural. A number of academic writers, starting with Karen Jolly, have deduced that the concept of supernature was not apparent before the 12th century. Prior to this, there was no division between natural and supposedly supernatural phenomena. In other words, elves and giants and dragons and so forth were thought to be as much a part of the natural environment as, well, hawks and horses. They were just seen less often, if at all. However, the idea that the landscape was populated by all but invisible beings is clearly attested. A 10th century prayer to bless the fields in Northumbria reads, Holy Lord, Father Omnipotent, Eternal God, sent forth your Holy Spirit with the Archangel Panchiel, that he may defend our crops from worms, from winged things, from demons, from lightning bolts, from all temptations of the devil, by the invocation of your holy name, Jesus Christ, who reigned with the Father and who lived with the Holy Spirit for ever and ever. So, clearly rural communities perceived perils, often invisible, but including serpents and flying things, to be, well, a significant problem. In a previous video, the one called G.K. Chesterton's School of Anglo-Saxon History, I attempt to explain why some cultures do not think of the gods and so forth as transcendental, as living in heaven. Neither the ancient Greeks nor the Romans had transcendental gods. Their gods are imminent. In other words, walk the earth. It was the transcendental beliefs of the Hebrews and other Semitic societies which shaped the Old Testament. Yet the New Testament attempts to incorporate a deity who did, at least for about 30 years, walk the earth. And it was this aspect of the Gospels which enabled early Christianity to be readily adopted in Northern Europe, the British Isles, and as a result um, convert the Scandinavian settlers in Britain from the end of the 9th century. All because their previous beliefs were entirely imminent. Why do we know this? Well, for a number of reasons. Surprisingly, one of the clearest is minor place names, usually field names, containing such old English words as elf, thurus, iotan, poka, shuka, dwey, and mare. Um, all of these words have many variant spellings. Now, don't be confused by modern understanding of, say, elves or dwarfs. Germanic elves were hostile creatures bringing disease and nightmares, quite unlike the often whimsical beings of modern fiction. Dwarfs were also unfriendly creatures whose one-time presence has been preserved in place names such as dwarf holes. The collective name for all these entities was the Old English word landwhite. It sort of corresponds with the modern phrase spirits of place and the Latin expression genii loci. Most of these land whites, these other than human entities, were considered anthropomorphic. The key exceptions were dragons and the old English concept of mare. Mare gives us modern English nightmares, but um, just to confuse the unwary, the word mare denoting a female horse sounds the same, but it has a different origin. Now, it's almost impossible to identify when the demonic sense of mare is being invoked in place names, as it sounds almost the same as two other Old English words fairly common in place names. One is mere, meaning a watery place, and the other is merch, meaning a boundary, as in markstone. But merch often lost the final consonant, the K, and contracted to mere lane and so forth. Uh, yes, it is confusing, and you're never going to get to the bottom of it all. There's also a problem with identifying puka. The old English word puka is spelt in a great many different ways, but it almost denotes some sort of unwelcome otherworldly being. In later folklore from brythonic speaking parts of the British Isles, puka are shape-shifting tricks of spirits, usually in the form of a domestic animal. On the Isle of Man, the puka is a ghostly hound. However, in Irish, the word puka corresponds to the English word ghost, I believe, but I haven't been able to check, that the Cornish concept of bocca, spelt differently but uh, obviously cognate, is also borrowed from the English ideas about puka. In English, the puka evolve into various tales of puck or pook, 
who in turn becomes indistinguishable from Robin Goodfellow. Uh, despite a substantial number of tales about Puck and Robin Goodfellow surviving from the early modern period, sadly most British people are unaware of this. They were both tricksters in the same fashion as Coyote, Br'er Rabbit, Anansi and all the other New World tales worked to death by modern-day storytellers. But while those storytellers are happy to pillage the tales of other cultures, they rarely attempt to transmit the indigenous tales of Britain, least of all those from England. Puckle were the most goblin-like of the land whites. Even in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, Puck is a mischievous fairy. We might also think of Puka as impish, sometimes helpful, sometimes troublesome. Human-like but diminutive beings abound in legends and tales. Puka seemingly give their name to various Puck or Pook hills. Best known is perhaps Puck of Pook's Hill by Rudyard Kipling. But... These hills may have been home to pocker, not puka. Old English pocker means fallow deer. So there's usually no way of deciding if puck, pook, place names derive from pucker or pocker. And similarly, Elfden in Suffolk may not be the denu or valley of the elves, but of the swans, as the old English word elfitu denotes a swan. Sadly, the earliest written versions of such place names are often much too recent to be reliable records of the original meaning. Swans are, however, otherworldly birds, in part because of their size, their unusual colour, and seasonal migrations, although British swans migrate less than their European or Scandinavian relations. So, well, either way, there's something a little paranormal about Elfton. Elf has many of the senses of fairy, as in the term fairy stories. And fairy stories are not usually about fairies specifically, but they are stories in which enchantment and magic feature prominently. For Anglo-Saxons, Elfheim, Elfholm if, if you like, was the corresponding realm where enchantment and magic took place. It's similar to fairyland, especially a fairyland thought of as being a real place under a hollow hill. However, in the mind of Anglo-Saxons, the word elf included entities which are quite alien to modern concepts of fairy. Elf included the Os, the Regan, and God. All these three words are collective names for deities, although we should be thinking more of local spirits of place rather than the universal deities of classical and Christian worldviews. So, yes, the Old English word God was hijacked with a considerable shift of meaning to be the name of the Christian God. It was the only one of these three words which was not inherently plural, so could be used to refer to a monotheistic deity. As the English language evolved, gods became the collective name for male deities, although in Old English the word os has exactly this sense, while well, God did not. Ideas never stay still. In the Anglo-Saxon era, the concept of elf seemingly changed into something less literal, as personal names such as Alfred, literally meaning the elf counselled, Elfwine, the elf friend, and Elfward, the elf guardian, and the other personal names incorporating elf uh, clearly attest. And in some respects, these Anglo Saxon names are close kin to Elvis Presley's name, as anybody born in Scotland is aware that Elvis, a variant of elves, is used to refer to what are Sassanacs called fairies. In passing, note that the sense of elf in Alfred the Great is akin to the way that Japanese people would think of, say, a powerful political leader as having kami. In other words, the person's outstanding achievements could only be possible if he was receiving advice from an other-than-human realm. There's also another curious link between kami and elf. Just as kami are easily offended if the person honouring them has not ritually cleansed themselves... So too the Scandinavian sagas reveal that elfin folk were driven away by <clears throat> shit. If you really need to know, the polite way to tell a Viking that you had a wish to defecate was to say you were about to gang Alfrek, which has the literal meaning of drive away the elves. Too much information? At the risk of oversimplifying things, Elf denotes all the good and bright aspects of such other-than-human entities. There's an even an old English word, Elfshinu, which means Elfshine. 
While shin, like glamour, was used to describe a beautiful woman, and I quote, not simply beautiful, but perilously so, according to the scholar Alaric Hall, the main usage of shin was to denote the deceptive appearance of anything paranormal. And while the evidence is ambiguous, early sermons and such like seem to regard biblical angels as elf-like. Um, bear in mind that angels were not native to British culture. They were a Middle Eastern concept, imported as part of the package of ideas which made up Byzantine Christianity. So it was probably helpful to regard them as having some of the attributes of bright elves. The related Old English word shinna specifically refers to a ghost or apparition, although more commonly the word used for ghost is grimmer, which, uh, to t cause total confusion to later scholars, also means a mask, and is also a very common personal name or nickname. But we can deduce from the use of grimmer that, that whatever the elf might have been, they were not confused with ghosts. The Old English elf had something else in common with medieval and later perceptions of fairies. Fairies had glamour, meaning not so much an attractive appearance, as the ability to hide their appearances by a veil of magic. As John Aubrey observed in the late 17th century, they could change shape in an instant. In his Miscellanies, of, published in 1696, under a list of apparitions, he wrote, Anno 1670, not far from Sirencester, was an apparition. Being demanded whether a good spirit or a bad, returned no answer, but disappeared with a curious perfume and a most melodious twang. Mr. W. Lilly believes it was a fairy. Overall, I think the Old English word elf shinu seems to be a synonym for the later expression flairy glamour. But the concept seems to go back to at least the mid-first millennium before Christ, as this sense of shine and glamour seemed to be shared with the ancient Greek words orga and Carunus. Whatever, elf were in pre-Christian minds distinct from more monstrous other world entities such as giants and thurs and dwarfs. As I say, elf seems to denote all other worldly things bright and beautiful. So, well, move on from the alpha to the darker side of the land whites. The old English words shukka or shioka are often translated as goblin, even though the only survivor of this word in modern use is black shuk, which describes a phantom black dog, um, which themselves evolve out of tales of shape-shifting entities. There are a surprising number of place names incorporating shukka. Most of them refer to a mound or small hill, Shacklow in Derbyshire, Shuckborough in Warwickshire, Shucklow Warren in Buckinghamshire, and both Shuckborough and Shugborough in Staffordshire. Uh, Shucknell in Herefordshire is a corrupted form of Shucker Hill, and there was also a Shucker Thorn which has come down to us again corrupted as Shuckton Manor in Derbyshire. The old English word for giant was Thurus. The Scandinavians referred to giants as, as Jotun. Indeed, they still do. Jotun is cognate with another Old English word, Jotun. Jotun and Jotun seem to be originally the sense of an immense eater, or possibly a man-eater. I've put together a previous video about giants in the landscape, so I'll just restrict remarks to a few notes about place names. In the Shropshire parish of Hiley is a field now known as Dustbatch, Early forms reveal this was Thursbacher until at least 1569. Thursbacher means Valley of the Giant Demon. And this is exactly the same construction of place name which got Alan Garner all excited about Thursbitch in Cheshire. In Cambridgeshire, the parish of Lakenheath once had a Thurs pit, in other words, a giant's pit. And then, in contrast to giants, there were also the dwarves. Old English dwiri denotes diminutive beings and gives us the modern word dwarf. Quite how human or not the dwiran were originally thought to be is a moot point. We now know that dwarfism is caused by several different genetic traits. However, traditional folklore would suggest that such people would be deemed to be fairy changelings, or perhaps something worse. Or maybe the Anglo-Saxons used the words to describe much less tangible entities, and the meaning simply transferred to denote human dwarves. Now, at this stage, we need to beware of the hobbits. 
One thing we must be careful not to do is think of dwarves and elves in the same way as Tolkien's elaborately constructed realms of dark elves, light elves, and industrious dwarves. Yep, Tolkien was a fine Anglo-Saxon scholar of his time, but most of his inspiration for Lord of the Rings came from Scandinavian sagas written down by Christian authors in the 13th century. The main author of this was Snorri Sturluson, and Snorri conflated the elves with the dwarves and added a distinction between light and dark elves, which was not attested previously. Understandably, Snorri's confusion has been passed down to many more recent writers, not just Tolkien. Tolkien's tales reveal his own wonderful imagination at work, in all its glory. But they reveal nothing about what Anglo-Saxons may have thought about Elf and Dwyran, still less that they would have been akin to Tolkien's hobbits and their ilk. Indeed, the influence of Tolkien's books has served to thoroughly obscure real Dark Age worldviews from anyone other than the more rigorous academics. Uh, just moving on, one category of land white, which was certainly not in human form, these were the drakes. Um, the Anglo-Saxons borrowed the Latin word draco to refer to dragons. And, according to place name evidence, dragons lived in mounds or hloes. As an example of Draco, a dragon mound, or perhaps dragon protected mound, in Bedfordshire, another one in Derbyshire, and a third in Worcestershire. In Nottinghamshire, there's a drac holes, and that has a parallel in Warwickshire with dwarf holes. And I've already mentioned the Thurus pit in Lakenheath. So it seems that to the Anglo Saxons, pits and deep holes in the ground were thought to be dangerous places populated by demons. We know from the old English poem Beowulf that dragons lived in earth caves. In translation, one passage from Beowulf reads, and it's the dragon speaking, I was bidden to dwell among thicket of trees under this oak tree in this earthen dugout. Ancient is this earthen abode. I am quite consumed by longing. The dales are dark, the hills high, the bastion town grievously overgrown with briars, their habitations void of pleasures. And elsewhere in the old English literature, several occasions dragons are specifically stated to be the guardians of burial mounds. The various references to treasure in burial mounds being protected by sleeping dragons are, well, they're decidedly earthy and they can't be deemed to be above nature. Uh, as I originally stated, the notion of a supernatural, a realm above nature, that seems to be a 12th century innovation. In contrast, the Landwites, the collective name for all these entities used by Anglo-Saxons, clearly were thought to live in mounds or even pits. Even their very name, Landwite, indicates that they walk the earth. There are no Skywites or any other such notion. So we can be confident that the Landwites are imminent, not transcendent. There's a name for weird things that are not strictly supernatural. Um, the word supernatural has a specific sense of above nature. The other name is preternatural, meaning beside nature. Now, OK, modern Christian writers adopted the word preternatural as like a catch-all term for all sorts of demonic entities they found troubling. But that's not the original sense. And certainly such befuddled thinking has nothing to do with my use of preternatural. The best evidence for a preternatural worldview from before the 12th century can be found in Irish and Cornish mythology. In Irish Gaelic, the counterparts to both English fairies and German alpha are the Aishi, or the Dinashi. Aishi and Dinashi both mean people of the mounds. I'll just use the term Aishi for convenience. According to the Book of Invasions, the Aishi walk among the living. Albeit the banshee, a female she, was believed to foretell deaths by wailing or screaming at night in a mournful, unearthly voice. But that belief seems to be recent, as the first written reference is not until 1771. The realm of the Aishi is an invisible world which coexists with the world of humans, a parallel universe in the parlance of modern sci-fi writing. In the medieval and later literature, they are variously described as ancestors, the spirits of nature, or goddesses and gods. The Aishi are believed to live underground in the prehistoric cairns and Iron Age ring forts commonly referred to as Raths or She. This old illustration shows how the Aishi were thought to live. 
It seems to have been a major inspiration for the creators of a 1990s BBC children's television series initially derided for its lack of pedagogical content. Numerous English writers have used the word she to refer not to the mounds, but to the I-she themselves, resulting in some unfortunate confusion. Uh, Despite much model thinking by modern writers, the original literature about the Aishi is not describing an otherworldly or supernatural race. Rather, they are an other-than-human entities which are entirely imminent in their ontology, just rarely seen and more often heard than seen. Brendan McMahon's detailed studies of Cornish fairy lore, published in 2015, also describe the Pixies and Bocha in terms which are imminent and preternatural rather than supernatural. While I'm not aware of correspondingly detailed studies of their Welsh counterparts, the Imamau, or the Mothers, they too seem preternatural. The English sensibilities about fairies are equally preternatural, at least until Victorian nursery book writers took hold, and even then they didn't really become supernatural. I hope this video has indicated the land whites of Anglo-Saxon England seem to be part of the shared ancestry of English, Irish, Cornish and Welsh law about entities which, at least according to English place names, live in such decidedly preternatural places as holes and pits and mounds, and the preference for mounds is shared with the Irish I she. For completeness, I will note that some scholars think that the Valkyries are evidence for supernatural or even transcendent entities in Scandinavian worldviews. I have my doubts, and simply think that whatever the Valkyries were originally, they have been reinterpreted according to later Christian concepts of supernatural beings. After all, our only evidence for Valkyries is from the 13th century writings of Snorri Sturluson, who was living at the same time Christian concepts of the supernatural were gaining ground. A more careful evaluation of the early texts suggests Valkyries were originally imminent and preternatural. Especially the Valkyries which are described as lovers of heroes and other mortals, and even sometimes referred to as the daughters of royalty. But Valkyries are interesting enough to have their own video. Maybe. One day. This video owes a great debt to the scholarship of Alric Hall, Sarah Semple, Jeremy Hart, Brendan McMahon, Susan Kilby, and several others. Details of their publications in the description below, and also a link to a web page with a longer version of the script for this video.